Does it seem to you like America went crazy all of a sudden? If so, you're wrong. It wasn't sudden at all. In fact, the groundwork has been laid over the past 500 years. There's a conspiracy against reality, and it goes all the way up to the White House. This is Radio Atlantic. I'm Matt Thompson, executive editor of The Atlantic. Hello. Uh, And I'm Jeff Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Also, hello. And a third hello to you both. I'm Alex Wagner, contributing editor to The Atlantic. In the fourth chair this week, we have Kurt Anderson. Hello. 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 Hello, Kurt. Hello, Alex. We're very excited to have Kurt here, aren't we? People. We are very we? excited. It's Kurt it. now. Don't sound like you're making a joke out no, of no, it. No, no, no. We're <laughs> honestly very excited. There, I'm excited for eight different reasons. Would you like to know four of them? Yes, please. Thank you very much. One, uh, he's the author of our September cover story. Two, he's a great writer. Three, he's my first editor in magazines. Really? Uh, I just had, I'm like Rick Perrying this. I don't really have eight reasons. Yeah, he was, I, I, my first magazine was New York Magazine when he was editor of New York Magazine in the mid 90s. This is after he invented Spy. Everybody knows that he invented Spy. And this is before he began his career as a radio host and novelist. And uh, I don't want to do the whole resume because it's, you know. <laughs> the fourth reason you're glad is because he's goddamn Kurt Anderson and we're happy to have him. Indeed. We're very happy that Kurt is here. And we're talking about a couple of things. We're talking about his cover story and we're talking about his new book, Fantasyland, which I think is one of the most extraordinary books I've read in recent times because it presents an alternative understanding of all of American history. I'm not going to try to recite that for you since he's sitting right here. I thought maybe we could start by you taking, I think you told me once that this started as a 200,000 word book and has worked its way down to a more acceptable level. Was 200 the right number? Uh, no, it was closer to 240. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I thought I was exaggerating. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, and now it's, it's a brisk. <laughs> and now it's a brisk 170. Uh, the, uh, no, it's actually, it's a quite, uh, it's a quite good size right now, but I, I want you to do the impossible and take your masterwork uh, and boil it down in, into about 60 seconds. And then we could jump off what you've done and, and talk about the book in light of our current political and social reality. So go. Uh, it's called Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. Now, it started as a set of questions that I've had for a long time. Why is America so much more religious than the rest of the developed world, for instance? Donald Trump wasn't even on my radar as I began this researching and writing this book in 2013, 2014. So, but then I, I went back to the 1960s. I thought that was an important time. And then I saw, no, 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 there are threads here. There is an American DNA that goes back hundreds of years. And indeed 500, before there was an America, when uh, Martin Luther nailed his theses on that door in Germany and started Protestantism. Uh, So how did America go haywire? Because we were invented as the first design built, made up from nothing country, specifically a Protestant country, specifically by a bunch of uh, truly a cult of religious zealots nuts, you could even say, uh, up north in Massachusetts, and some people who desperately wanted to believe they could find gold in Virginia and the South, and kept believing that for years, years, a generation without finding any. So these two groups of fantasists started this country, and a combination of our extreme religion, by which I mean Protestant religion, uh, our extreme kinds of blue smoke and mirrors devotion to making money and business that was fairly unique in the world at the time, the entrepreneurialism and the the verging on con game that that entailed, our show, our love of and really invention of show business in, in mixing in that. The religions kept popping from uh, Mormonism through Christian science to Pentecostalism and beyond. The, the hucksterism kept going from P.T. Barnum to, oh, Donald Trump today. Mm. And here we are. And and so I, I was writing this history, and as I was finishing the draft in in the winter-spring of 2016, here comes Donald Trump so, sort of 
becoming my exhibit A. So, Kurt, you're the first writer in history, as far as I know, who's drawn a straight line from Cotton Mather to Donald Trump. And, and that wasn't my intention. Uh, Donald Trump. I can't was, imagine any writer having that no, as an intention, no, by no, the way. No, Donald Trump <laughs> wasn't in this book uh, when I started. I'm not sure Cotton Mather was either. But the, <laughs> the fact of, of America's extreme Protestantism, by which I mean. You don't have to, we don't need your stinking priests, we don't need your stinking Vatican, we can figure out what is true and what is false based on our own communication with God and reading scripture. That became central to American individualism, kind of <laughs> epistemological, ontological, I can, I can think whatever I want. And that was kept in balance for a few hundred years pretty nicely, and it worked out okay in this country, and then it started not to, and then we got Donald Trump. Well, let me just, I, I'm going to let everybody to jump in, but I'm I just so fascinated by this, because the book is, in a way, a history of America as as a place uh, uh, shared by the grifted and the grifter. Correct. Right. So, so and, and the true believers. And the true believers, right, but, but magical thinkers. But I, my difficulty with the book, I think it's a brilliant book, but my difficulty is that I really like America. And me too. I, and I'm no, I'm not, not, not <laughs> testing. This is not a patriotism test. Um, no, I really like it. And I think some of the negatives that you've identified are also positives in the sense that the belief that you can do anything is very useful when you're trying to build a completely new country that's innovative and creative, et cetera. And, and also the belief that, that there is a God and that the God wants you to be just interpreted through certain people I'm sure you'd agree with, like Martin Luther King Jr., by your standards, your atheistic, communistic standards, kidding, your standards, is a magical thinker because he believed that God had a mission for him on earth, but that mission turned out to be a useful mission. And I don't think you're a commie. You might be an atheist, but I don't think you're a commie. Uh, you can go now. Yes, yeah, Jeff? Now, yeah, now, now, now. I finished lecturing uh, No, no, uh, of course they're, they're, they're good things. And again, the, the argument of the book is that America is great, is exceptional in many ways, but instead of just saying that a million times and and not looking at the particular peculiar downsides of I, I'll believe anything, I can do anything, I can I can be anybody, oh, yeah, all those have good sides and have until, in my view, those aspects in all realms, economic, political, cultural, religious, and otherwise were allowed to kind of get out of control so about 50 about years imbalance. ago. It's, it's a book about imbalance. About imbalance. Can, I, yes. can I ask a question, though, Kurt, in terms of our singularity? I mean, this is a new moment for America, but I wonder if similar things haven't happened all over the world. I mean, when we talk about sort of magical realism and the hocus-pocus society and the sort of conspiracy theorist government, I go back to my mom's from Burma, right. where at one point they outlawed a whole – like section of currency based on an astrologist's report where they moved the capital city to Napiedaw at 6, I think, 16 a.m. on some certain calendar day because, again, the astrologist said that's the right time to move the capital city up north. And, um, you know, there are comparisons made between Donald Trump and plenty of other sort of banana republic rulers all over the world. So, you know, isn't this something – is this – I guess my question is, are we really unique as Americans? Are we uniquely nuts? Of, we <laughs> are uniquely nuts in the countries that aren't, say, Burma or Banana <laughs> Republics. We are uniquely nuts in the developed world. That is my argument that, about our uniqueness. And, of course, not unique. There are, yes, there are conspiracy theorists and, and people who believe supernatural madness and, and New Age craziness in all, in, even in other developed countries. But it's it's... Us and the less developed countries, as opposed to what we used to call the civilized world. Us versus but, uh, Europe. Us versus Canada and Australia. I'm curious, where do you see this long trend manifesting most today? Where have you seen, I mean, when you look around, there's a lot of stuff yeah. happening. You and, mean besides the White House? <laughs> well, well, again, the, as I said, the, the book was done, essentially, when Donald Trump appeared as a plausible presidential candidate and then president. So there are lots of places. I mean, Alex Jones has been around for 20 years. I had a whole chapter about Alex Jones. Uh, Alex Jones, the paranoid radio host. The paranoid InfoWars, Texas-based radio host. Uh, so there's that. And, and again, in the, in the, there, there is a history of this. And one of my points is that Donald Trump didn't just pop into existence with all his nuttiness and uh, alternative facts 
in 2015. There was a history. There was there was a book, for instance, called Behold a Pale Horse that came out in early the early 90s that was incredibly influential in creating this uh, conspiracy theory view of the world. Of course, before that, uh, two generations, there was the John Birch Society, which had also laid the groundwork, especially on the right, especially in the Republican Party. So today, yes, there are there are, there are the conspiracy nuts, the anti-globalists, the, oh my God, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Aspen Institute and the United Nations and, and, uh, <laughs> the Aspen Institute, and, yes. and, and, and CBS and all of them are, are, are trying to put us in camps. Um, so that's been around and it's just, it's, so it's been normalized. It's, 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 it's moved over, over the last 50 years, especially from the fringes into and then to the mainstream and now into the White House. So there's that. There is, again, as a, I'm not an atheist. I don't, I'm not a Richard Dawkins, even Chris Hitchens atheist. I, 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 I don't, I don't believe in uh, a particular religion. That's true. Right. But and you don't believe in an intervention as God. I do not believe in an intervention as God. I do not believe in faith healing. I do not believe uh, that I'm talking to God, that people talk to God. I don't believe. Well, you believe that people talk to God. You just don't believe that God talks to people. The, yes, that's the correct. That's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and and again, because the, the we secular infidels for so long have have kind of like eh, let's just ignore that. Let's only pay attention to the Pat Robertsons of the world and and religious people when they involve themselves in politics. Let's ignore what they actually believe and practice. And I, I find it astounding. I find it absolutely you know, astounding. One of the things I think is interesting, though, too, Kurt, in terms of the sort of institutional roots of all this, you don't just place I won't the onus at, at square like the feet of religion. At one no. point, you write that hated establishment, institutions, and forces that once kept us from overdoing the flagrantly untrue or absurd media, academia, politics, government, corporate America, professional associations, respectable opinion in the aggregate. They have enabled and encouraged every species of fantasy over the last few decades. What do you what do you mean by that? Tell us more about that. Well, I mean, yes. So there's the, there is the extreme fantasist supernaturalist wing of Protestant Christianity that has taken over Protestant Christianity. So let's leave that aside. But let's say, oh, uh, the television industry and ha- and and that over the last couple several decades, cable channels put on quote unquote documentaries about mermaids and monsters and all this <laughs> stuff that are that are documentaries on the history channel on arts and entertainment on on national geographic and that is presented to 300 and odd million Americans as oh this is true this is a documentary that's one example the book publishing industry has published all kinds of publishes a bestseller every year, essentially, about somebody who visited heaven and came back and tells us about it. So that's... And, but those are true stories, Kurt. Oh, right. I'm, I'm mistaken. Kidding. I'm kidding. I know Go you ahead. are. Go I ahead. know you are. And, you know, the... the this the, is why we have fact checkers in the Atlantic, by the and way. And academia, <laughs> in its in its squishy academic way, has permitted, as I, it should, in a certain sense, all kinds of nonsense to be taken seriously and not stigmatized. Um, you know, and I, I go back to the, to the, and I repeat many times in the book, the, the great famous Daniel Patrick Moynihan line, everybody's entitled to his or her own opinions. They're not entitled to their own facts. And starting a few decades ago, Americans decided that they were entitled to their own facts. Well, let me ask you this, Kurt, because this is, I think, one of the key arguments of your book. Um, this book is not uh, a book about how uh, our, the right wing in America is crazy. The book is about how a lot of people across the spectrum are crazy. And one of the things you argue, and I want you to sort of dilate on this for a minute, is that uh, is that the 60s, the, the relativism, relativism of the 60s, it was introduced by the left, on the left, that everybody has their own narrative, everybody has their own feelings, and, and, and all these things are legitimate. That created conditions, I think you're arguing, for the rise of Right wing nonsensical thinking. Correct. A little bit later on, this is not a, not necessarily an argument that's going to please your friends in uh, in Brooklyn. No, many people will be angry about uh, what I say. And 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 again, I've been as I've been thinking about this and putting this together and talking about it and writing in little bits and pieces about it over the years. People on the cultural left and political left both. Uh, d- don't like to hear what I say, which is exactly as you summarized, Jeff. Which is that in the starting in the early '60s, with the 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 bohemian countercultural 
quote unquote left, but right. bohemianism, cultural, yeah, yeah, the, counterculturalism, the, the, yeah. more than political leftism, uh, allowed, yeah, do your own thing. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Your feelings are more important than any empirical facts. All that, together with with a, a kind of, you know, post truth tendency and di- set of disciplines in academia and sociology and anthropology all over the place. All that, I, I would say the greatest consequence is having enabled and empowered the, the American right to- To do bo- the same thing. To do the same thing and also attain political power. Right. I found it really interesting reading your book right after reading Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, in part because the narrative that he spins, one of the things that he argues makes homo sapiens, us humans, unique, is our ability to spin myths, to spin fables, to believe stories, to to make systems that aren't necessarily empirically true, but that organize people in all sorts of very powerful ways. One of the most potent of them being money, finance. Uh, In 2007, the economy's falling apart and the Fed decides to do quote unquote quantitative easing. They start just saying, Money exists where it hadn't existed before, and we just all decide to believe it. And that that ability to all kind of fall in line behind a myth is what enabled humankind to actually prosper. Right. I, I read Sapiens. I've read. Therefore, many, you should become a Mormon. And I've read. And, and I've read I'm many sure. many histories of religion which make similar and adjacent arguments. Um, Another thing that happened in in the 60s is is exactly what he argues in that book, which is that all reality is socially constructed reality. That became a commonplace consensus view of the academy, really. And – Thank you, thank you, French postmodernism. Well, not and 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 Austrians and Germans and lots of people whose whose ideas we imported and then adopted as true. And okay, that's an interesting argument, but once – it becomes an argument that anybody can use to justify any belief that they want to impose on themselves, their family, their community, or the nation. It becomes very problematic. So, sure, nothing is real, as the Beatles told us back then as well. But mm-hmm. once everybody is allowed to act on that belief, and that becomes part of our kind of American mental operating system in a way that I think it's more so here than elsewhere in the developed world – I think it gets problematic. And it seems like all of that is exacerbated, and you write about this, by the sort of disruptive moment we're living through in terms of information and communication. So you said that digital technology empowers real-seeming fictions of both the lifestyle and entertainment kinds, as well as the ideological and religious and unscientific kinds. So there's no escaping this craziness, is there? Well, there isn't. And and that's why I, I pull in, in addition to connecting Cotton Mather to Donald Trump, I, I connect Joseph Smith and Mormons and all that, for instance, to Disneyland and to American show business and to our special knack for creating very realistic fictions in movies and video and now virtual reality and the rest and Soho's of the world that are, oh, look, it's a shopping center, but it's old. It's not old. It's new. All that, <laughs> which which America is beautiful in many ways and extraordinary in many ways, but adds to the Americans, all of our abilities to never, to, to be iffier about what's real, what's not, what's authentic, what's not, what's my truth, what's my, and and it it works all together. We are all in this soup of, semi-reality and unreality, which into which, not to return all the time to Donald Trump and alternative facts, but into which that really finds uh, a place to root and spawn and spore. So when we come back, we're going to talk about where this has all led us and namely one President Donald Trump. You, almost single-handedly, were out there questioning President Obama's background. You said, how can you not show a birth certificate? But Trump comes along and said, birth certificate. He gave a birth certificate. Whether or not that was a real certificate, because a lot of people question it, I certainly question it. You know, his father was with Lee Harvey Oswald prior to Oswald's being, uh, you know, shot. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. 
This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts. So, Kurt, I want to come back to this point of, of, of America being a country in part of a grifters and the grifted without stipulating, because I'm trying to be a responsible journalist, that the president of the United States is a grifter. He shows signs, obviously, throughout his past of having taken advantage of uh, poorly educated uh, consumers. He he is a more of a showman. He's literally a reality TV star. You are one of the great observers of Donald Trump going back 30 years, I think, when no one could have imagined that this man would be president. I mean, two years ago, no one could have imagined that he could be president either. But, but walk us through, because it's totally fascinating. How did you, when you were at Spy, is that when you noticed this very odd New York real estate character named Donald Trump, who is larger than life and, and, and worthy of satire? Yes. Uh, we, okay, we, thank we, you. Okay. We, we started Spy Magazine <laughs> in late 1986 when he was just cr becoming a big deal in New York. He'd, he'd, he was, he'd just finishing Trump Tower, building Trump Tower. He was this young hustler who was a perfect character to obsessively report on and name call and ridicule in this new satirical magazine that was at initially all about New York. So and he was, Short Fingered Bulgarian was yours? Short Fingered Bulgarian was, we, we invented lots of epithets to call various people we talked about regularly, like socialite war criminal, Henry Kissinger, uh, and 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 it was an old it was an old Time magazine thing. Time magazine used to have those things, and we sort of reinvented it in this way, in a sardonic way, in yeah. a sardonic way. So we and and every time we mentioned them, we we liked to append that uh, epithet. So we went through a lot, uh, several uh, f with uh, Trump before we hit on the one that stuck, which was short fingered Bulgarian in. Uh, Early 1988, actually, and that was based again empirical reality. Graydon, shortly before Graydon Carter, my partner in Spy, shortly shortly before we started the magazine, had profiled Trump for GQ magazine, which led, in fact, to the owners of GQ publishing the Art of the Deal. But that's another uh, part of the spy, <laughs> yeah, of the okay. Spy Trump scholarship. Um, he said he came back and said, "This guy has such short fingers for a." guy who's 6'2". And so we just thought that was a funny <laughs> juvenile thing to attach. It wasn't about his manhood or any of the stuff that he and Marco Rubio made it during the presidential campaign. Right. So anyway, we were watching him and reporting on him about his his various lies, brags, uh, just all of the stuff that we now know as Trumpism was there in 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 you know uh, as a when he was 40. Tell us about your own interactions with him. Well, because you had some weird things. Not so weird. I well, mean, letters sent to us on his very, very, very thick and fancy stationery uh, threatening massive litigation multiple times right, for that's what, no fun. what we were doing. But he never sued, of course. And and we again, we, we saw the Trump that everybody sees now, this guy who blusters and threatens and barks and amounts to not very much. What? Kurt, was he was he more tethered to facts, figures and reality when you first met him? Well, yes and no. He he lied and and uh, exaggerated a lot. More tethered? I don't know. He was not. He was a joke. He was a real estate. He was a you know uh, an apartment building developer and a casino operator. So, no, he 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 didn't tell the truth. But who cared? You know, it didn't matter. And he wasn't saying the president is wiretapping me or three million illegals voted or. Or, or so he was. He's become more conspiratorial, and the sort oh, of darker yeah. side is more prominent. For sure, case. for sure. What was clear then, thirty years ago, was this absolute demand of of loyalty in a kind of gangsterish way. Uh, uh, that was there absolutely, and that's he, the Roy Cohn piece, right? I, I think it yeah. probably is the Roy and the Donald Trump piece. I, right. I, I don't think we should blame Roy for everything that Donald right, is. Right. But uh, Kurt sure. Anderson, pro Roy Cohn, <laughs> yeah, Roy Cohn sympathizer, um, Kurt but, Anderson. But uh, so no, it was. There's nothing new. It's just more extreme. And, you know, he he seemed happier then. He had he was more relaxed then. He he was so it was he, it, he's just because he was he's now 
the same, only more so, and the president of the United States. You described it as, as somewhat unimaginable from the vantage point of 30 years ago in New York that he would become president. Was there any indication that he would ever want to become president? And where in your three-decade-long study of the man and his character uh, did that aspiration spring from? Well, weirdly, back then, when it was a complete joke, in 1987, he was talking about running for president. And indeed, we did some uh, national polls w with the help of Mark Penn and Doug Schoen and Frank Luntz, people who became famous later right. about tendentious polls, but real polls, for instance, asking, who are you unhappy, America, that isn't running for president in the 1988 presidential cycle? Donald Trump was one of the names we offered, right. and we found that some small percentage of Americans said they were unhappy he wasn't running, and we had a whole article begging, pleading with him to run that America wants you, because it was a joke. So we thank have you, you in Thank fact, you, Spy <laughs> Magazine. Thanks very much. But, but no, he, and you know, he, he talked about it, as we know, every four years. Yeah. I think he understood finally, or sensed in his lizard brain, feral brilliance that, okay, 2008, 2012, it's getting close to where the, the, my, my sense of say anything I want and get away with it, including for well, instance, that Barack Obama is, wasn't born in the United States. We're there now. The, the America is now ripe enough in this fantasy land way for me to have a shot. Do you think without reality TV and the internet, this would even be possible? I don't know that, I, but I, I do think that key to my whole argument and key to Donald Trump as an avatar and embodiment of my argument, reality TV, news as entertainment, several cable channels, two of them without happy to be entirely partisan, and more, more than all of those, the internet permitted this, this – <laughs> epistemological free fire zone in which uh, Donald Trump made his play. But Kurt, do you feel like uh, the ascendance of Donald Trump to the highest office in the land has forever changed the American political appetite? I mean, he may not be there in office in four years, eight years, 12 years, whatever. <laughs> I said 12 just because. Um, but, <laughs> but do you think America has sort of been awoken to that kind of politician, someone who will indulge in the darkest fantasies and, and hand out sort of, um, you know, the cotton candy sort of mirages about how things can just be so much better and easier and greater. I mean, is, as it dovetails with the theme of your book, I mean, is, is this an ADBC kind of moment? I think it probably is. And I think the $64 gazillion question is we don't know in what ways and to what degree it is. I, I don't think that there are going to be a lot of Donald Trumps following Donald Trump. But I do believe, or I, I expect, that the discourse and what is politically possible for candidates and, and the political discourse to be permanently changed, probably for the worst, even though, you know, those of us, we few... Uh, we, we band of sisters and brothers can fight to say, look at this. We don't want this to happen again once it all comes a cropper, once we're not all winning, once we all don't have the greatest, cheapest, best, fantastic health care that anybody's ever had. Once people see that Donald Trump was a charlatan and a, and a grifter, I would like to think, oh, well, that everybody will decide, oh, that was just a momentary uh, overdue, right. like uh, we went to Vegas and got married. But, but uh I, I worry that it will change things for the worse, as well as waking everybody I mean, listening the, to this podcast to how we so must avoid it. In the has future. the Overton window shifted permanently? <laughs> That's the question. You know, there's this idea that 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 he has he has created new space for disgusting coarse discourse, or or do we all somehow snap back? I mean, I, I just I I can't imagine once the boxes once the Pandora's box is open, how do you get this stuff back in? Well, well no, and and and, that, and that's again, I've never been a declinist. I've never been a real pessimist about America. But I, I don't know the answer to that yet. And, and, and I don't know. And I, and I, I think my, my belief and, and kind of where I end the book, uh, it was what I end the book saying is that I think it's possible that we can make it get no worse, that this is peak fantasy land and, you know, that, that we can contain it and we can, and as it in the real world, because not all Americans have lost all sense of reality, we can ratchet it back and people will say, oh, okay. That was, that was, we, we went overboard there. 
but going back to the way it used to be in reality-based America, and again, I talk, I mean, it, it wasn't just with Trump. Let's remember 2004, Karl Rove telling Ron Suskind of the New York Times, oh, what you people in the reality-based community may think. It's, it was there for a long time and being used cynically for a long time before this ultimate cynic uh, used it to become president. How do you see people like Karl Rove or to some degree Kellyanne Conway, people who otherwise you'd assume have their feet planted firmly in the world of actual, you know, sort of reality facts figures, but indulge and in, in some ways spin and further the sort of alternative facts, the world of alternative facts. I mean, where do they f sit on the axis, in well, your opinion? Well, uh, Kellyanne will go to a deeper level of hell, perhaps, than Karl Rove when the time comes. Uh, see, I'm not an atheist. Um, uh, <laughs> he doesn't believe in heaven, but he believes in hell. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Uh, no, I, I, I mean... They are they are spin doctors, right? So of course their job is spinning the facts, as are trial lawyers, as are lots of people. Um, and 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 in the in the Trump presidency, because Karl Rove wasn't on the Trump train, he he hasn't gone as far as say Kellyanne Conway has. The really complicit people in this abandonment of factual reality have a lot to be held accountable for. And again, the Carl Rose and the Nixon strategy, and it goes back farther than Kellyanne Conway, you know, have some confessing to do as well. But uh, the fact that, I mean, again, I, and I don't want to get, and I don't in the book get too strictly into what Mitch McConnell or Marco Rubio should or shouldn't do, but that this Republican Party is now Trump's Republican Party, which means a party that is, doesn't care about factual reality is a real problem. One of the looming and unresolved questions, at least in my mind, about this election, which is the the overwhelming support Donald Trump received from evangelical Christians, a, yeah. a group you write about extensively. Yeah. Uh, it, it, to my my mind, it just doesn't compute. I mean, yes, I know the argument. They're, they're strategic voters, and they know that the Supreme Court, he would do what they wanted on the Supreme Court. And and, and that's a that's a sufficient uh, – it's not a sufficient uh, right. uh, argument, actually. Maybe, maybe it's part of it. But how do you, as a religious person – and I'm not – you know, I'm going to assume that they're genuine in their feelings and they're genuine in their love of Jesus and of all the things that Jesus said. How do you possibly look at this person – and and see a role model, see a leader. Well, in lots of ways. There's also, apart from any religious belief, there is a, an overlap with the the what has been talked about a lot, obviously, which is the people who feel that the elite is con contemptuous of them and feel resentful. And from, that's a real strong. And that's, that's a, a real, real thing, strong thing. And it's a real thing that Donald Trump himself feels, and they feel it, they see it that it's real. He's not faking the fact that everybody in this podcast has always been contemptuous of him. He knows it. He resents it. And people in, in uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, feel, have felt for two years, that's real. He's, he's a billionaire. He's got this hot wife, but he's one of us. Yeah, but the truth is, the truth. I mean, I'm not speaking on your behalf, but, yeah. but, but, but the truth is, is that you might feel contempt for Donald Trump. I don't actually think you, Nebraska boy, Kurt Anderson, you, you don't feel that level of contempt for the, the ordinary person Correct. in Iowa or Nebraska. Not a, I mean, not a bit. I mean, so, not a bit. Yeah. But, but that's what they have in common. The I, other thing I would say that truly, sincerely religious people, sincerely religious people who believe, I'm sorry, things that are so fantastical uh, that I, I, I am gobsmacked every time I, I talk to people who believe these things. So if, you're, if your life, if your religious life is believing in things that I would, I would bet my life aren't true, um, then how far of a leap is it to accept a guy whose own grip on reality is as iffy and whatever he feels and whatever he wants to think is true, I think they have that in common. So they recognize a characteristic? I, I think they feel that like, huh. oh, he he has this, he, he, he may not have the facts, but it's true in some sense that Muslims were cheering when the towers went down, or it's true that uh, this thing he says, that three million illegals. I don't know if we're three million, but it's true. There's too many illegal immigrants from uh, Mexico, and they are here. So that that sense of the the fungibility and and whatever you want it to be, nature of factual truth, 
I think that is a thing they really have in common. He has in common with charismatic and evangelical Christians. The name that kept coming to mind as I was reading your book um, uh, is Dr. John Romulus Brinkley. This is a figure who um, was a very popular and influential in the first part of the 20th century and who experienced something of a revival in the past year. Um, there's been a great documentary called Nuts that I recommend about the doctor. Um, the, the show Reply All did a fantastic episode called Man of the People about him. But he was um, sort of the original huckster quack doctor. He developed a snake oil therapy by which he would take tissue from goat testicles and uh, inject it into men to stimulate their fertility. He and, had me at goat testicle, by the way. <laughs> and he also <laughs> founded a radio network that was in many, many ways the foundation of modern talk radio. He, at one point, was so popular in Kansas, where he lived, that he ran for governor of Kansas and uh, the powers that be, the bureaucracy of Kansas, the deep state of Kansas, if you will, had to engage in all sorts of chicanery to prevent him from actually ascending to the governorship, potentially avoid, averting some sort of greater trauma. He finally uh, had a license, his license reviewed by the Kansas Medical Board in 1930, and his tail sort of began to peter down from there, but the influence that he left stays with us. And there's so many people. I, I feel like I have to go rush back and do a quick chapter on uh, Mr. Brinkley because he belongs in Fantasyland. But that is that is the American way. And it's just truer here. There are more of those people here than in any other developed country. There just are. And, you know, other countries didn't have their Joseph Smiths inventing a new lost version of the Bible and a new theology and all all that became Mormonism. Other countries didn't have a Mary Baker Eddy who believed that all illness was just a, uh, an illusion. It's true that most new religions come out of the United States, right? Yes. I, I can't think of, uh, can you think of other places? We've that got great imaginations. Well, no, that's the point. <laughs> that's the point. That's no, the point. It's and, genius, and, genius in all directions. Well, and also yeah. other places have had religions for a long time. Well, I mean, right. you, you know, the Middle East was a pretty, by your standards, a been a nutty place. Kurt, I'm just reminded of the start of this conversation when we talk about creativity and innovation, and aren't they sort of bedfellows with conspiracy and delusion, which is to say, I mean, on one hand, yes, we have the Alex Joneses of the world, and we have the strain of of dark doomsaying, but on the other, I mean, the other, the, the sister to that or the cousin to that might be, you know, innovation and, and all the wonderful developments we see in places like Silicon Valley. Aren't they necessarily twinned? The, they, well, yes, they are twinned. And the, and the question is one of balance. The question is the old Goldilocks problem of not too cold, not, you're not France, you know, not too hot America. You're, I don't know, Denmark, let's say. But, but it's, it's moderation. And for, for hundreds of years, there was this reality check, this Yankee pragmatism and show me and I demand the facts and all that. And an establishment that was confident in being an establishment and telling the charlatans of the world that they were charlatans and banishing them. That kind of ended and we got out of whack over the last 40, 50 years. And to read Kurt's full account of these past few decades and how they led us to this moment, check out the September 2017 issue of The Atlantic on newsstands and always at theatlantic.com. And now at the end of every conversation, I ask you for your keepers. What is it that you've recently seen, watched, heard, read, experienced, encountered that you want to keep that you do not want to forget? What do you want to carry with you into the future? Well, especially coming off this book that I've been working on for several years, that is privileging, reprivileging rationalism and all that. I, I had this moment uh, a couple of weeks ago being out uh, in nature and, and realizing the things that happen in nature that are equivalent to magic. I mean, fireflies being the most obvious one. But then, and I wasn't high. Then the, the uh, you know, just the, the, the wind, the breezes. I thought, wow, birds taking off. I thought, wow, the, the nature, it is magic. And then... You weren't high then, but you're high now. I, I am not. I am not. I could be legally because uh, I'm in Colorado. This last week, I, I, I love synch great coincidences and, and synchronicities. And I don't believe I, I, that they're signs from the divine or the netherworld, but on... 
Monday, this la last Monday, I'm I'm getting off the subway. I I just heard a podcast by Ezra Klein, in which he interviewed Al Franken, Senator Al Franken, for an hour. I, th I was really impressed, and I said, "Wow." Senator Al Franken is as close to a kind of Trumpian authenticity as big name Democrats have. He's funny. He's, eh. 2020, I push send. I walk into a building where I do a lot of work. Somebody says, hey, Kurt, it's Al Franken walking toward me. I go, whoa. And again, it, which makes me understand why people do believe in supernatural things. Next day, I'm interviewing a big record mogul named Jimmy Iovine. And uh, yeah, where'd you grow up? Uh, turns out this, this incredible billionaire, Apple record mogul, Bruce Springsteen, John Lennon guy, grew up on my block, on my side of my block in Brooklyn. And so we just spent half the interview talking about literally this block. And, I, and again, that gave me such a rush as <laughs> running into Al Franken had. I had, again, coming off this, no, we must all be rational. None of the, There is no teleological order to life. It's all random chance. Made me think like, man, it's great when it seems like it isn't. So that's what I want to keep. Kurt, you do believe in magic. That's hard <laughs> <laughs> The uh, I think I, well, I, I have a predisposition to our teleological thought, so I'm with Kurt on this one. <laughs> I was going to offer up a book I reread for the fifth time, E.L. Dr. O's Billy Bathgate, but I actually also reread another favorite book that, that pertains to this conversation, Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History, the definitive, or one of the definitive biographies of Joseph Smith. And in the context of this conversation, Joseph Smith is in a way the ultimate American, right? The most self-created sort of uh, a figure goes into the woods, invents a new religion, uh, and, and more to the point, gets people to follow it. It's such, a, it's such an amazing story. And her book is this incredible deconstruction of his actual life. Life, not yeah. the life that the church puts out for people. The other, the other thing I would say is this, and Kurt's probably going to be upset by me saying this, but all of this conversation about fantasy land, uh, all of this conversation about manufactured reality, I have very, very fond memories of taking my kids when they were small to Disney World and Main Street USA, which is the fakest thing ever, right? But it's, but it's charmingly fake. And, and, and this is probably the reason I like Main Street USA is the reason I like on a personal level, Ronald Reagan and Walt Disney himself and all these people that they, they decided that reality isn't good enough. So let's just make a better one. And I understand why people are susceptible because I myself like taking my kids down Main Street USA. <laughs> Alex, Sorry. what besides uh, magic and Disneyland do you want to keep? <laughs> Well, those two things remind me of my, at the risk of becoming someone uh, shilling for a, a company and, and putting product placement into our podcast, which I would never do. <laughs> Magic Disneyland, the thing that's missing from that is ice cream. And I just want to tell you guys, I had a pint of the, not personally, I didn't eat the whole thing. There is a place called Trickling Springs Creamery. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. It's like my version of, I would imagine, Disneyland, and it's in Pennsylvania. And I, I just want you to know that they make ice cream that tastes like you're already high. It is that good, if anybody's ever been high. And I had this, and it literally set my week, which has been a bad week, I'm not going to lie, on the right path. And I think that the lesson I learned from that is sometimes the simple pleasures really are the best. So the thing that I would like to keep, there is a competition in the Philippines in which uh, seven to 13 year old kids uh, sing. They compete like many of our singing competitions. And a clip has been circulating not far enough of one of the judges on that show uh, who brought three of the grand finalists into his nightly talk show to do a performance of Beyonce's Listen. I want you to hear this and I want you to keep in mind that these are boys between the age of seven and 13. Um, just listen. <laughs> I 
found this clip thanks to the Twitter feed of Joshua Henry Jenkins, at Josh Jenks, who asked, what is happening and why are these babies slaying my spirit and belting the edges right off my head? So I don't know what that was a testament to, but man, humankind. That's humankind. a testament to your fundamental weirdness. <laughs> Matt, that's what and, it's a testament And you are to. very interesting internet habits. Yeah, Matt. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spends a lot of time in weird places on the internet. Thank you very much, Kurt, for joining us this week. My total pleasure. Jeff and Alex, a Thank pleasure. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. Kurt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Thanks. Kurt. This episode of Radio Atlantic was produced and edited by Kevin Townsend with production support from Katie Green and Kim Lau. Thank you to Paul Ruist and Jamie Rosenberg for audio support. Thanks to John Batiste for our amazing theme music, including his incredible version of the battle hymn, which we will play in full once again after these credits conclude. If you like the show, please make sure to rate and review us on iTunes and also send us your thoughts. As always, you can find us at theatlantic.com slash radio or facebook.com slash Radio Atlantic. You'll find those links as well as a link to our show notes in the episode description. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.